in this lecture, we're going to talk about some very fundamental information regarding APA citation. So all of you should be somewhat familiar with citation, whether it be APA or maybe you've used MLA or Chicago style or something else. But in the health sciences, in any health science or medical profession, we always use APA citation. This is considered the scientific uh, citation. So the first thing that we need to talk about is why. Why do we have to use citation? I see sometimes, uh, you know, these memes of like APA citation is going to be the death of me as a student. I get it. I have been a student for a very long time myself, and I used to be very frustrated with proper citation. Uh, but as I got more and more educated, I really started to understand the importance. So I'm going to talk to you guys about the why, because I don't think that was really conveyed to me as well. So we've all heard the term fake news. Uh, it's sort of become a catchphrase, but it does have some real meaning. A lot of people are gullible, and those who aren't able to distinguish good information from bad information can really put themselves and others at risk. So I happened to come across a news article this morning. It was in regard to a Facebook group that had been created by some lady who was touting a cure for autism. And this cure was ingesting bleach, forcing your child to drink bleach, and somehow that would cure their autism. And she developed this large group of followers of moms, I'm sure, who were desperate, who weren't getting um, the, the really the answers that they wanted from traditional medical science. And it's astonishing to me that people would forego uh, credible information and, and medical science and follow someone with absolutely no medical or psychological training whatsoever and actually have their their autistic child but these are the things that we're up against these days as health professionals so it is important for you to understand that that fake news is real uh, in the sense that it is really uh, misleading to people and they do believe it so if you take a look at this slide for instance now obviously this is a joke right but the humor shouldn't be lost in it um, because what you see and read might not really be credible evidence even though it looks like it could be so the sources and citation of what you're reading can tell you so much more about the credibility of the information so you guys are going to become experts at APA citation by the time you leave us and here is the why. The first thing is that you want to prove your claim. Is your claim substantiated by reputable evidence? So, for instance, whitening toothpaste. Now, there's a company that has no um, real shelf space in, in dental care that is a home-based um, a product like a um, an MLL MLM product that is being sold as whitening toothpaste and it has gathered a lot of attention I see this in my feed all the time um, and I think that the people who are selling it are well-meaning uh, and there might be cases of it actually whitening um, appearing to whiten the teeth but it's really that you know the patient had a lot of plaque or surface stain and the whitening toothpaste just cleaned them up um, and any toothpaste could have done the same thing so it, it looks like it's been whitened but it really hasn't and the other caveat to that is that I often see them using creative photography so if you pay careful attention to the before and after photos you'll see a drastic lighting difference so the before photo uh, the teeth appear very dark and very um, uh, maybe even brownish and in the the after photo the entire photo appears light so the teeth teeth have lightened up but in that same circumstance the skin and the lips have lightened up as well so that's sort of a dead giveaway and, and really a joke in dental forums because um, you know you you want them to at least be a little bit better with their 
um, photo cropping or um, you know photography in that instance just just only whiten the teeth in your photo instead of the skin too but they don't so uh, you want to be able to prove your claim and, and frankly there are no actual whitening agents in that toothpaste I know that because I am well versed in all of the agents that are in toothpastes and I know which ones are whitening agents and which ones aren't and that particular toothpaste has no actual whitening agents in there uh, so the second thing is that we want to give credit where credit is due. Um, Peer-reviewed evidence takes years to come to fruition. So you want to give credit where credit is due. We're going to talk about what makes something peer-reviewed in just a little bit. But that information uh, did not come easy. So make sure that you give credit. Um, and then we want to avoid plagiarism. So I've seen several articles in the dental world um, be plagiarized. And in fact, I've had my own information plagiarized before. So I've written several articles uh, for different magazines and every now and then I'll come across a post in social media where somebody's ripped off my work and posted it as their own. So what they do is they'll like go to my article and copy the, the content and then paste it in the forum as if they created it. Um, so it's not only unethical to do that, it's illegal. And thankfully, most of our admins of these forums are great, and I will just message them and say, hey, someone ripped off my article, and they'll remove that person and the, and the article for me. But higher education agencies like TJC consider plagiarism very seriously. So you want to make sure you avoid plagiarism whenever possible. So we want the, the reader to find the information. So if I'm reading one of your papers and you're telling me that that information came from a certain book, well, I want to be able to know more about what that book says and read the content of that information in the book. So I need to be able to know where you got the information so I can go follow up and read more about that. as well. So what makes a source Credible. We're going to talk about each of these things individually in the, in the coming slides, but you want to ask yourself these three questions. No matter where you got your information, does it have authority, is it timely, and is it accurate? The first one we're going to talk about is authority. <laughs> You'll see my little meme here. You referenced Merkula. Well, Dr. Merkula is a well-known fake news agency that is really made fun of in every dental and, and healthcare forum. Um, but people are very gullible, like I said, so they will often tout Dr. Merkula as science-based evidence, um, and it just uh, makes you kind of look like a fool when you do that. So um, one thing we want to know is, is there an author? Uh, is there an author and what is that author's affiliation? So if I have someone who's written an article touting the benefits of a new Crest toothpaste, but the author of that article works for Crest Oral-B, well, that, you know, makes their information much less credible. They have an ulterior motive for writing that article. Has that author produced more works? You know, can you go through and look at their body of work and see that they generally produce good, credible work? Um, are their works cited? Um, can you contact the author? And then what is the domain? So a domain means, you know, when you type in a website, um, google.com. Well, .com stands for commercial. That means it's a commercial website. So Google is a commercial business, and that is the domain of their website. In order to have a .edu or a .gov domain, like if you were to type in the address for TJC, it's www.tjc.edu. In order to have a .edu or .gov, you have to go through some pretty strict vetting process to make sure that you are an approved entity. So not everybody can get those domains. So .edu and .gov are generally considered more of the credible website sources that you can use. Sometimes .orgs are okay, uh, but .coms are generally avoided. There is an exception from time to time with the .coms, uh, but in general, you wanna try to use something more credible. 
If there's a tilde, that little mark that you see here in the URL, then that might indicate that it's a personal web directory, so that's definitely not going to be a credible source. The second thing is timeliness. So ND, when you're doing a reference, if you see ND, uh, that would mean no date. You're going to hear me say this over and over, um, but yet I have students that will continue to get deducted for timeliness even in their last semester. So this is one error that is easily avoidable and I'm gonna show you how to know if your source has no date in a few minutes. But please remember, if your source doesn't have a date, that's a deduction. So you wanna to prove to your reader that your information is timely. For my courses, I generally accept anything within the last five years, uh, with some exceptions up to 10 years, but you wanna to try to use the most current evidence-based information when you're presenting. Uh, when you use a date, you want to use the most current date. So if a source has been revised or edited or updated, you want to use the most current date available. If you're getting your information from a website, you can scroll all the way down to the very bottom, and usually you'll find the last date of the update or the copyright date, and that's the date that you're going to use on a website. Accuracy. We want to make sure that our information is accurate, right? So the best source would come from a peer-reviewed publication. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. But you want to make sure that any information contained within that source has credible information in, as well. So for instance, does the author cite statistics? Where did they get those statistics? If I were to tell you that 98% of all statistics are made up on the spot, <laughs> Hopefully you get that, because I just made that up. And a lot of people use statistics in their everyday language. That doesn't mean that it's credible. So you want to make sure that if they're using some type of statistic, that they have information to back that up. Okay, so a peer-reviewed journal. Uh, how, how does a peer-reviewed journal work? Well, first, there has to be a study or some sort of article review. I'm going to take a drink real quick here. So there has to be a study or an article review and that's someone who's who's researching or maybe they're looking back through a body of articles to gather a, a lot of information from those articles um, but they generally do this study for a very very long time uh, sometimes years and then after they're through with their study then they uh, write some sort of review they're gonna write some sort of article or review over that um, so you've probably heard of people talk about a thesis or a dissertation, and typically that's what they're doing. They're actually um, writing some sort of review or study uh, based on the information that they've been working on for a very long time. So after they have written their article, then it's going to go to the journal editor. And the editor of that journal is going to send that article to a uh, basically a peer panel of experts in that content area. So um, if I'm writing an article based on some research that I've done to um, determine if this toothpaste um, reduces gingivitis more than another toothpaste, well that that review is going to go to an expert panel of people in dentistry or scientists in dentistry. It's not going to go to someone in politics. So it's a, a peer expert peer review panel. And so a lot of times that panel will come back and say, well, I don't understand how this is written or I don't like um, the, the way that this is explained. So could you fix that and clarify? And so they'll do a lot of back and forth and this can take months. And then once everyone on that panel gives a sign off that that is a legitimate um, article, it's, it's well written, then it can go to publication. So it's a very long, arduous process. So once it's, it's written, um, it's been very well vetted by a panel of experts. Um, so to give you some examples of peer review journals in dentistry, um, we have the Journal of American Dental Association, the Journal of Dental Research, the Journal of the American Dental Hygienist Association. So we have several in dentistry, and I'm not saying that those are the only credible sources, but those are the most credible sources. 
here's a little cheat sheet slide for you. Use this, not that. Um, and this is not an exhaustive list, but hopefully it'll help guide you towards the right direction. So what are some of the things we want to use? Well, for this class for oral anatomy, um, if, if you're listening to this PowerPoint in oral anatomy, we're, we're mostly going to stick to textbooks. Um, I think I'm going to have you attempt an outside source in, in a few weeks, but my goal for you in this class is that you would get really well versed in fundamental APA citation by the end so that you would be able to cite from your textbooks relatively easily. Um, if you're listening to this in a subsequent class, uh, you're, you're going to notice that our expectation goes up and up and up until in the last semester you are expected to use a, a very good APA citation in all of your works and do that independently. But we're going to demand more and more higher level evidence from you through uh, peer reviewed journal articles uh, through like PubMed and Medline. Um, and then things that we want to avoid would be, uh, like I said before, dot com. Wikipedia is a terrible source because anybody can edit Wikipedia. It is a public uh, run site, so uh, it is written by and ran by the general public. So anybody can make an edit on Wikipedia. Um, I'll give you an example to the, the dot com because I told you before there are some exceptions. Uh, but for instance, when you're looking up medications um, and their side effects and uses and all that stuff, we, we would allow using a website such as drugs.com that generally has credible information uh, but otherwise, you kind of want to avoid the dot coms. Uh, blogs are just opinions, movies, um, anybody's opinion, personal web pages. Those are not good sources. Okay, so we're back to the date thing. So uh, here I have an example of a reference for you right here. Um, and it has a variety of issues. Obviously, it's from Wikipedia, so it's not a credible source. But let's focus on the date on this slide. So here you're going to see where, where there should be a date, it says ND. That means no date, and it renders the information not credible. So if you use ND, I'm going to reference you back to this PowerPoint to review this slide before submitting another assignment. So ND, if you're not sure, if you see ND anywhere in your reference or your in-text citation, you're going to get a deduction. So I know a lot of you are going to use citation generators, and I'm actually going to show you how to how to utilize a citation generator at the end of this lecture. But you have to be very careful because sometimes it will not fill in the date for you. And so you're going to have to, to fill in information that's missing. So don't rely 100% on the generator because it could mislead you. Okay, let's talk about in-text citation for just a, a, a little bit here. When you write a sentence in your paper or post uh, in a discussion forum, something that came directly from someone else or that you paraphrase from someone else, you need to give them credit for that information. So if you're quoting directly from another source, like the textbook, you're going to want to put quotation marks around the information that's directly quoted from that book. And then you need to include the author's last name, the year the source was published, and a page number or paragraph number that you found that information. If you're paraphrasing, that means that you're putting the information into your own words. So it's not your idea, it's someone else's idea. You've just rephrased it and put it into your own words. You still need to give the author credit for their idea, but you don't have to put quotation marks because you're not quoting them directly um, but you do need to put the author's last name and the year. We're going to look at some examples of what I'm talking about. Direct quotes. So here I have an example of a sentence from the textbook. And part of that sentence I made myself. The sublingual salivary gland is located in the. And then the rest of the sentence was quoted directly from our text. So sublingual space, floor of the mouth, medial to the body of the mandible. I, I couldn't have known that on my own because I'm not an expert. I am, and I did know that, but 
let's assume I'm a student, I don't know that because I'm just learning. So I need to give credit for where I got that information. So since this was directly quoted from the book, I have quotation marks around the part that's directly quoted. So beginning of the direct quote, end of the direct quote, and then where my sentence would normally end here, there would be a period, but I need to give credit to the information that I just took from that author. So this is where in-text citation comes in. The first thing I need to do is open a parenthesis. And then I'm gonna list four things. So let's go back to the direct quote slide. I have to have four things. I need to have the author's last name, I need to have a year. I need to have quotation marks around the direct quote, which I already have, so I have one of the four. And I need to have a page number or a paragraph number. If it's a website, you have to use the paragraph number instead of the page number. But for us, for this text, I'm gonna use the page number that I found that information. So I have opened my parentheses. I have my author's last names. There are two authors listed, both of them, comma, the year, comma, the page number that I found that information. And it has to be in this order. So it has to be the author, the year, the page number. In that order, close the parentheses and then put my period. So everything contained within the purple parentheses here, that is what an in-text citation is. A direct quote example, another direct quote example, um, this one, the entire sentence has been directly quoted from the text. So you can see at the beginning of this sentence, I have my opening quotation mark. At the end of the sentence, I have my closing quotation mark. And then before I put my period, I need to give credit to that source. So I open my parentheses, I have my authors, I have my year, and since it's a direct quote, I have my page number and then I close the parentheses and put a period. That tells me that this quote came from this author on this page, period. With paraphrased information, the idea is someone else's, so we put it into our own words, but the information is not common knowledge. So uh, with this example, the information was somebody else's idea, but I rephrased it so, so I don't have to put direct quotes because it's not directly quoted. It's my paraphrase. Um, so on, on the in-text citation, I don't have to have the quotation marks and I don't have to have the page number. So I do it exactly the same way, except at the end of the sentence, before I put a period, I open my quotation mark I mean, my uh, parentheses, I put my author, my year, close the parentheses, and put a period. So some of you are going to notice that in one example, I have the author's last name and first initial. And in another example, I have just the author's last name. Either way is fine. So if the authors have a different last name, you can get away with just putting the last name. If the authors have the same name, then you definitely want to put the first initial or you're going to get them, you can't say Smith and Smith. We have to know what the first initial is of each of those. Things that don't have to be referenced. Uh, your personal opinion does not have to be referenced. If you want to tell me that that dress is ugly, that's your personal opinion. You don't have to reference it. It's not somebody else's information. You don't have to reference your own conclusions. So if I were to give you a case study and the case study was Mark, and he's a smoker, and all signs point to the fact that he's not ready to quit smoking. And at the end of this case study, as you're writing, you tell me it doesn't appear that Mark is ready to, for tobacco cessation. That's your personal opinion, your, your conclusion that's drawn on facts. So you don't have to reference that. Anything that's considered common knowledge. So I've given you some examples of common knowledge there. Uh, it, generally, people, it, we learn about the teeth in elementary school, and everybody should have common knowledge that there are generally 32 permanent teeth. Now, a lot of us have our wisdom teeth taken out, so a, a lot of us only have 28, 
but uh, but you are made generally with 32 permanent teeth. Um, we live in America, so it's common knowledge in America that the Statue of Liberty is in New York City. Um, it's common knowledge in Tyler, Texas, that this is the Rose Capital. So uh, these are things that everybody or the consensus of the population, uh, most of the population, would have knowledge of, so you don't have to quote those. Things for which you are considered an expert. So when I'm talking to you guys about all things dental, I'm considered an expert in that. So I don't have to reference everything I'm telling you. I'm telling you based on my own um, experience, my own um, knowledge of the research, um, and my credibility as a professor. So I, I don't have to reference generally when I'm speaking to you. Um, however, if I was doing a CE presentation or I'm writing an article um, then I would still reference because I have to add credibility to myself as a speaker or as a, a writer. Um, so at the end of your paper or your post, you have to list your full reference. So remember we were talking about in-text citation so that I know where that source came from. But at the end of whatever you're, you're writing about, you need to give me the full reference of that information. So here you have um, the difference between works cited and a reference is works cited is used in MLA and reference is used in APA. So it's the same thing, it's a different style. For APA citation, you need a full list of your references at the end of your essay or paper or submission. Your references should be in alphabetical order by the author's last name. Um, so here I have an example of a full reference. So if you remember in our in-text citation, I told you that I got that information from Fehrenbach and Herring, the 2016 edition or the 2012 edition, whatever it was. Um, so at the end of that, you need to have what that full reference is, which is gonna include a lot more information like the name of the book or the article number, where that can be found, um, where it was published, who is the publisher, and then you should be able to find the information from that full reference. Here's an example of what a full reference should look like and you can see that these are alphabetized by the author's last name. Um, and here, you know, one mistake that I see um, students making is listing the same reference several times, uh, but that would be a mistake. I'm going to talk more about that in just a second. I have this little cheat sheet here um, that you can kind of follow as far as how to um, do your in-text citation. Here's some pointers for a full reference. Um, each source you're using in text should have a full reference listed in the references section at the end of the paper. So if you have put an in text citation and you don't list the full reference at the end of the paper, that's going to be a big error. Um, you do not have to include references that you did not use within the paper. So for instance, let me go back here. If you're telling me that you used this reference in your paper, but within your paper, there's nowhere where you actually cited this reference. Then either you failed to give credit to that author for the information that you used, or you listed a reference that you actually didn't use. So that's gonna be an error. Do not list a reference more than once in the references section. I see this happen a lot when students are learning APA citation. So let's pretend that you used this reference five times in your text. So you have in-text citation of this reference five times. You don't list the full reference five times. I only need to know what the full reference is one time. And then I'm, you're telling me within the document itself, well, I used this reference in this place, this place, this place, this place. So you're telling me every time you've used it by using the in-text citation. So don't list this five times just because you used it five times. You only list each reference, full reference, once. In the in-text citation, you list that reference every time you use it. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is give you an example of how to use a citation generator. Um, and remember, don't, um, don't rely 100% on the generators. You're welcome to use a generator that you like. Um, this one is just one that I got accustomed to when I was in 
uh, grad school and so I, I just know it better. But you're welcome to use one that you like. Before I show you how to use the citation generator, in order to get credit for viewing my lecture today, I am going to have you submit two things to me through Canvas. The first thing that you're going to need, and you can just do this all in one submission, but you need to tell me one thing that you learned new from this lecture that you didn't know before, and one thing that you worry about that you might get wrong in doing APA citation. And you can submit those to me on Canvas, and then you will get credit for attending class for this week since this was an online lecture. Okay, so now on to the citation generator. Okay, so I'm going to show you guys how to do the citation generator. I'm going to use CiteFast.com. Okay, so you can see here they have APA, MLA, and Chicago. And remember, we're always going to use APA citation. Now for... Uh, Oral anatomy, we're mostly going to be using our book. If you're in a different class, uh, you may have to use uh, the other tabs there. Um, but let's just start with the book so I can give you an example of how to use the citation generator. <clears throat> I'm not sure why that popped up, so just ignore that. Okay, uh, so here it's going to give you an opportunity to enter the book title, the author, or the ISBN. So I'm, I'm just going to use the title of a book that I recently read. It's going to pop up here. Ah, there it is. That Good Night, Life and Medicine in the 11th Hour. So if I was going to reference this text, um, when I click on that, it's going to bring up the autofill. So this is the form. It's autofilled in the information that it has for this textbook. And it's giving me a preview here of what the full reference would look like. So let me look at this and see uh, if the information is all there. So we have the author there. I have that it's in print. Um, and we're referencing from the entire publication. Just always choose the entire one. Uh, and then the year is there. Um, the author, the book title, the publisher, the publishing city, the publisher. Um, so it's all there. There's there's only one edition, so we don't have that. So I can go ahead and this looks like all the information is there. I can go ahead and save this. So once it has been saved, it's going to give you right over here what your in-text citation should look like. And here you have, this is for if you're, you're using a direct quote from the book, remember you have to have a page number. Um, and remember, if we're not using a direct quote, then we can end it after the, the year. So this is gonna be a really useful tool for you. Um, and then you can actually just keep building the books that you've used. Um, let's see. Uh, go ahead and add um, the 21 irrefutable laws of leadership by uh, John Maxwell um, and it looks like all that information is there as well so I can go ahead and save this um, and you can just keep building every reference that you use and then when you're done um, you can double click this and it's going to pull up all of your references and you can just copy and paste them that, that's generally how I like to do it. You're welcome to do it however you want to, um, but it's going to be a, a good useful tool for you, especially starting out. So once you master how to cite from our textbook, then you can start to venture out into other things and um, build your ability to use APA citation properly. So I think that's uh, pretty much it for this lecture. You may have to go back and 
view it again or view different slides again and that's perfectly fine you're you might be a little bit rusty that's fine too you just have to keep working at it and then it'll become very natural to you but if you have any questions feel free to email me otherwise i will see you soon